people to watch after you. Oh, that's what it is. All right. Well, we've sorted it out. Yeah, here they are. Um, yeah, no. Uh, first off, big thank you to uh, Hilanka for letting us be a part of this film. Um, so a broadcaster in Canada called Yes TV approached me maybe about six weeks, two months after the terrorist attack and just said, Mark, we just want a story told about what's going on in Sri Lanka, what's happening in the churches, what's happening on the ground with the victims. Uh, but they didn't have a story yet. And so uh, I, uh, they told me their schedule. They needed to go right out in three weeks. Jeez. And they only had a week for me to shoot in country. So we worked with them and said, no, we'll need maybe about two weeks. And when I looked at the schedule, I just said, I can't do this by myself. And that's when I called up Mike, who's a good friend and a fellow documentarian. And Mike had the same camera package, the same lenses, and the same uh, approach to his filmmaking. So I was like, hey, if I can duplicate myself, and even better, I would say with Mike, then <laughs> wow. we can have two of us in country filming the same film in different places. So we brought Mike along. And, even every, though we, and we had one producer. We had one producer, Amelie Brune, amazing. She crushed it. So suddenly, uh, what was a 10-day shoot almost felt like a 15, 20-day shoot because me and Mike were only together for yeah. maybe about five of those days. But we got to say this. We, we have a lot of filmmakers on this course. Uh, if you're in the ALD community, let us know. Um, we were not given characters. So the, the idea was Mark had to do some type of story that followed the aftermath of the bombings. And so immediately... We talked to Emily, our producer, Mark and I, we all hit Instagram yeah. and started using that. At, and I've been using that a ton, by the way, amazing resource. And we started looking at Sri Lanka and just trying to find yeah. who are people involved in kind of the aftermath of this. And that's when we stumbled upon this group called Heal Lanka. Yeah. And we reached out, we found out who were, was running it and we got on WhatsApp, we arranged a conversation and this is like, you know, hey, we're going to be there next month. And, you know, we are, we've been seeing what you're doing on the ground. And, and so we had to find the people to bring us into this story. So it wasn't only interviews talking about the story, but how do we... Mark and I wanted to have people on the ground. We wanted to have a voice. We wanted to have Amjad and his, his friends and colleagues actually be our hands and feet. So there was a little bit more of a um, intimate feel to yeah. the documentary. Yeah, and someone's asking right now, wh what do you look for in a producer in this film? That's Harry... Harry, the one thing, I reached out to my own uh, um, producer uh, from Revolver Films, Richard Querdon, and I asked him, I said, hey, I'm going to do this project. Do you know any good documentary producers? And he thought about it. And the first thing he thought, he goes, I have a friend who works in film but does humanitarian work. In Sri Lanka. In, in Sri Lanka. And he introduced us to em Emily. And what was amazing is, is, is Emily, uh, she's not only has experience in Sri Lanka, but she was a film producer. So we were like doesn't matter if we can find the best yeah. producer in the world this woman has been to this country she has drivers she knows people there so it was it was the right decision so often what you're looking for and is she experience. took and, and she took a pretty discounted rate i mean she's a commercial director but because she had that love and attachment with the country and she had been there during the bombings hadn't she yeah. or she had just no she was supposed to but the bombings had stopped her trip. so it it meant something to her. Yeah. And that's often people ask me all the time, how do you find a producer? Do you have to pay them an, an ornament, some amount of money? Do they get ownership? What's the deal? Everyone's different. For Emily, it was, you know, we had a small budget on this project, but she had this passion to do it. And she friggin' did a lot of work while we were there. It was basically the three of us and some local fixers. But for the most part, it was the three of us figuring out scheduling. We got to be at this church on this day. We got to drive to the north of the country on yeah, this day. Yeah. And, and, and Amjad and his team were, were also, we talk about this in, our, in the course, The Art of Documentary, they were kind of our co-directors and writers as well, like kind of leading us into different, they had relationships. And so they helped us get into some of these churches that were closing themselves off to a lot of media. But because we were able to build those relationships quickly and they knew the type of film we were making, it, it, uh, it ended up working out very nicely. Yeah, no, it, uh, to just answer a couple of the questions here, um, uh, do we work as individuals or organization? No, me and Michael, that's why if you see the beginning of the film and at the end, there's Escarpment Films, that's my production company, and M Films, which is Michael's production company. So 
we uh, we work as individuals, but and collaborate they, when it makes sense. Yes, exactly. Mark's doing a film right now on on autism. I'm not involved in that other than maybe giving some unsolicited advice yeah. or solicited advice. Um, and then I'm you know I, I'm working on clear. Well, Mark's also working on Clear Sky. He's the DP on that. So, but you, you know, but you did like Nike's big bet, and I wasn't part of that. Like we, yeah. we There's when it makes sense. Yeah, we when bring it, each other in. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But it's not like you know we're we're still we. You never need to. You don't need to overthink that stuff. You, you'll notice in Hollywood, even there's there's frequent collaborations between actors and directors, yep. directors and producers. They have people they like to work with, but it's not set in stone that you need to work with those people every time. Like the composers in this film, for instance, we got a lot of feedback, uh, um, uh, positive feedback as uh, the film was playing. Those were two composers in Toronto that I had worked with on another TV documentary and they had done a great job on a fairly minimal budget in a short time to deliver something beautiful and they just took feedback so well revised quickly and we use them again here and so again that's that's I haven't I didn't use them on my next film but I will probably use them again when it makes sense yeah yeah it's one of the questions here too is how do we work under such uh, difficult circumstances in terms of the emotional subject. Funny, most of mine and Mike's films end up being in some level of crisis. Michael just finished a film, his name is Ray, which is about the methamphetamine crisis, looking at one specific character. Homelessness. Homelessness. Uh, I've done Riscate, which was the second most dangerous country to drive in the world. I find on set, the camera kind of keeps you insulated a bit i find the most difficult part personally is when i go to review the footage at night i'm suddenly struck by the humanity mm. of it so um one of the things we do is we we decompress back in the hotel room at night mike who filmed the scene with debbie the poor girl who lost her eyes we just had to chat about it you just you have to keep it verbally processing or else there comes a moment when yeah. it, it can kind of hit you and so yeah you gotta have a beer you gotta go work out mm -hmm. you know you've got to talk to loved ones You've, you've got to, you know, as Mark said, I think that having somebody that you trust, whether it's a co-director or a producer, you know, somebody that you can work through this stuff with, because it's, it is intense and it takes you to, you know, it can take you into a dark place and ultimately you can't stop rolling. Like no. you still need to be, you need to be doing your job so it can impact you later, but it can't impact you while you're doing it. It's like a paramedic or something, you know, on site, they've got to be on, they got to, they got to save the life afterwards is when they're going to need some help. And it's yeah. when you're doing stuff like this, it's, it's kind of similar. Yeah. I think, yeah, just don't bottle it up. is really like the most important thing for and, us. And to me, I'll say this, I mean, again, all my films have like thorny psychological topics. The editing for me is the therapeutic process. For me, that's when I get to kind of unravel it. So it can be it can be this kind of intense thing you're filming, having to work through while you're actually in production. But then the editing is where you can place it. You can you can see it more holistically. You can see it in a bigger picture, and it doesn't feel as hard because you you can see how you know the different uh, maybe more redemptive elements or the more yeah that there's other stuff beyond just that intense moment. Yeah. And yeah, I really appreciate Dolly. Uh, if you want to ask a question, put the at Mark Bone because there's it helps me know who's asking a question. Um, Prime lenses, <laughs> AF MF. This was back in the FS7 days, all auto, uh, all manual focus, and mostly prime lenses. Can I can I just say, as someone who's non technical, we can have a debate here forever. I still think I prefer the manual focus. Yeah, yeah. There's moments. For interviews. For interviews. The only reason I like the auto is sometimes on interviews, but honestly, it becomes a it's the lazy man, it's the lazy woman's option for focus, and I just feel like yeah. I, I've been getting into so much trouble. I'm looking back on footage, and it's just it's just adjusting so yeah. much, and then yeah. I'm all turning it off, and then I come back to it because oh yeah, it's nice now. But anyway, I preferred it. Yeah, I still think computers are terrible at recognizing. Well, where you yeah. want your eyes to yeah, go, exactly. you know. So Here, it's a computer can recognize a face. A computer does not recognize uh, storytelling. Yeah, really. it doesn't know my intention to yeah. all of a sudden focus here and then come here, right? So anyway, that's a side point. Yeah. Um, uh, what are some other questions here? Uh, were we able to sink into the background as a cameraman in those situations? So It was tough. We talk about it in the course, uh, in Module 2, uh, about meeting your character and like and how you... you, you the first time we met Hilanka... Uh, we didn't know if they would, ex you know, they were wonderful people over messaging, but, you know, 
they're in the middle of crisis. Like their country has just had terrorist attacks. We didn't want to come in and just bring a camera into the room. Yeah. So we, we met didn't, them we didn't want to be perceived as journalistic or me yeah. or media. Like yeah, we taking, were, you know, yeah. we wanted to be exactly. Yeah. So, sorry, I cut you off. No, no, but that's so we. The first night you were first saying. First night we didn't bring in cameras, but. And we uh, had and we had dinner together. We had dinner together, and they were just incredible. And so uh, we knew that we could be very present with the camera. We explained what, the story we were trying to tell. We didn't try to hide anything, uh, and then we just had to kind of foot to the gas, you know? Like, and obviously when you're in a country, and I've, you know, Mark and I have both filmed lots in Africa and Asia, and it's like, you know, we're, we're white guys in a non-white country. There's no avoiding the fact that you're white. Um, so in that sense, you do stand out a little bit, but I, I have found you just embrace it. Like you don't, you know, there, what else are you going to do, you know? And you have a camera. We don't have huge crews, you know, it's me and Mark uh, walking around with some cameras and you just... I don't know, we always have local fixers or, you know, our characters are local, gener obviously. And so, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's one of those things blending in. You don't, you're not trying to be invisible. You're, you are there. You're there with a camera. You're, but you're not the center of attention. You know, you're – and you don't I – think, I think a lot of filmmakers just starting off can become too easily distracted. Yeah. They're a bit too sensitive. Like, listen, you're there to film. You've flown across the world. Don't, like – get skittish and turn the camera off like you're not supposed to be there. Just film. Don't worry. If, if someone comes and gives you a problem, then you can maybe talk to them, but just keep rolling. Do your job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how long have we been working on this? So you may have been, if you've been following me for two years, you'll think that I've been working on this film for two years. Michael and I were approached it. We had a month of pre-production, maybe three weeks. We were in country for two weeks. Then we edited it over probably pretty slow over three months. And then we gave the the a locked yeah, cut in, in end, end of November. Yeah. Then we spent a month on music and color. Yeah. Uh, so we we gave it to the broadcaster. It's about uh, six month turnaround. Yeah, yeah, six month. We gave it to the broadcaster March twenty twenty, right in the middle of the pandemic. And then Was it really, uh, right? we uh, we haven't really touched it since. But working with a broadcaster, they always get first window, and so they had a year where they had the sole rights to the film in Canada. That's why you're finally seeing it on YouTube, where the contract now is up with them, because they pay for the film. So what they need in return is exclusivity. That way, it drives people towards their platform. Um, a really uh, quick question. Uh, oh, yeah, do you guys have a focus puller? Nah, we are the focus pullers. You can't you can't fly a person around. We're the not world. using cinema lenses. Yeah, I mean yeah. we're just, we're using the art that we use all like the Sigma art lenses. They're you know I, the photography lenses. Those yeah. those things are way easier if you're using cinema lenses. We couldn't even would... afford a a sound guy on this. Yeah. So like yeah. we went with a small team. Simple. Simple. You, here's the thing. Mike's Mike's really smart. Mike spent three thousand dollars on a on a shotgun mic. Now that's a lot of money for one mic, but. Yeah, it saved him a lot of money when we don't need a sound guy because we put that mic on our camera and we it's use a wide good. lens and we get in close and yeah. it's, it sounds amazing. So all I, that I purposefully like just don't pack gear because then I don't have to use it. I think that's and the better less strategy. To, less to forget, no yeah. less, less, less things to, to le lose. Less to forget, less to use. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Jeff, uh, module one, we speak about uh, about the sticky notes. That that's how we built this edit. It was all with sticky notes on the wall in our back office before we even opened up a timeline. Uh, we talk a bit about the pre-production pre and the editing on this film, but in module two, that's where you're going to get me and Michael talking about Just needing... Just you do it. Uh, oh, yeah, we talk about but you do the director's commentary. I do commentary. the director's commentary and right. speak on behalf of, of, of us. Um, we've worked together yeah. enough now though that uh, I, I know Mike's uh, intentions and, and methods, and I love them. Um, and then uh, we also talk about just meeting your character in module two. Right. So you, you can get the whole uh, director's commentary, like breaking down the whole film while you're watching it with me in module two. Which, by the way, guys, you can still get the Art of Documentary. It's still open. You've, you've missed the early bird rate, but it's still open. There's still some seats available in the course. So Not uh, for long. Not for long. You can check out the link, theartofdocumentary.com. Um, I think there's some AOD fam in here. If you're part of the AOD community, you can comment in the chat. We love seeing you guys here. Um, uh, what else we got here? How do you both manage the entire shoot of the documentary with just the both of you? Imagine readiness alerting the situation. We we talk about yeah, Mike, Mike Mike was on some coffee coffee every morning, but we we, we I'm mixing my coffee with Monster. <laughs> That's how I go about. And then I Kino Octane. My yeah. buddy Greg O'Gallagher. I, I mix that with Kino Octane, and then yeah. I'm good to go. I I say this. We talk about this in the course. We 
you never want to be an aimless filmmaker. So you want to be assertive. So before the day begins, me and Mike aren't talking about what should we do today. No. It's the night before, and then we sandwich schedule. We talk about this in the course. The morning is when we're shooting B-roll. The sun is the best. We want our films to look beautiful and cinematic, so we capture B-roll. Then in the middle of the day, this is when we work with our characters. This is when we're doing interviews inside. Or honestly, to me personally, I, I, maybe I put too much emphasis on aesthetic, but if our characters at, aren't actually doing something then, and then this is when we take a little break. Mm -hmm. Like the light is terrible. This is when we think- Get some what food. Can, no, right, some you, food. You, you recharge. We recharge. We might look a bit for the footage, make a plan, go location scout. Then as the light starts going down in the get day- Get lunch. We get lunch. I'll, I'll be, I, I, let me say this seriously, because I'm kind of joking, but I am serious. Like, you know, when you're on these sets, these type of doc shoots, 10 days intense, in country, away from your family, different time change, you know, your, your time change is swapped more or less. I'm serious when I say like diet, nutrition, yeah, sleep, absolutely. especially going into it. But even there, like you can't be skipping, you can't be skipping stuff. Like every chance you get recharge. And as Mark said, then you can kind of, you're feeling better so that you're not getting to the end of the day when the light's the best and you're like, you're out of energy. That's when you want to be, you still have energy to go out and shoot. So you yeah. got to take care of yourself. You and, and I always and, get sick on these jobs because I'm I know. so focused on it. And that's, I know. it's terrible. And then, and then you sacrifice, you know? 100%. So, you know, just make sure that those are little practical things, but yeah. they do go a long way when you're really pouring yourself into this type, exactly. of, type of work. Exactly. Get your shots traveling. I guess vaccines are a controversial topic, but we made sure that we had Yeah. <laughs> yeah I wasn't going to get sick. Yeah. That would be bad. You just, you just got to embrace the, some of the suck. Yeah. It's um, the Shep C-M-I-T-F-U. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good. Uh, I got it though. I did not buy it full price. I bought it on consignment from a sound guy. He worked on X Men, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hugh Jackman used to talk into the mic. It was it was a very special microphone. Yeah, it has the spit of some famous yeah, people. Yeah, exactly. On it. <laughs> but so I got it a lot cheaper. I probably got it like thirty percent off, which was great. Um, how was the process different than Fifty Eight Hours? Simply put, I was we, we were the production company. It, it, it had my insurance was covering it. Uh, you know, we we worked through all of that. Where Fifty Eight well, Hours, I was hired as a uh, as a, a contractor. And, and let's say, I mean, I'm going to say, but still that with the broadcast, it was there was in terms of filmmaking process, it was a massive difference, like day and night difference in that. We made we were making the doc as we were filming. Yeah, <laughs> like we we had ideas. Like we had written a treatment. We loved the idea of starting with those kids and finishing with those kids, but like we did not know what we were getting in country. We didn't know what churches we were definitely going to get into. We didn't know what Amjad and his friends were going to be like on camera. We didn't know how that storyline was going to play out. When Mark did Fifty Eight Hours, it was like you know they had a good structure. They it had just, a, it was just getting the puzzle pieces the right. way we wanted. Right. So this, in, in that sense, this, and, and this we figured out a lot more in the edit in terms of the story itself. That, like you'll see that in module one. If you go to the sticky notes, a lot of rearranging act one. Where, where do we put the civil war? Yeah. Should we put this later on? Yeah. It's like, how do we, where do we place all this stuff? You'll see how we work through that. So in, in that sense, this was more of a traditional um, documentary where, you know, it's, it's being shaped through the filming and the editing process quite significantly. Yeah, it was. It was, uh, there was moments where Michael and I looked at each other on set. We're like, do we have a story, man? <laughs> like, yeah. Like we really, it was a lot of, we knew we were shooting lots of stuff, but it, you're the, right. The thing we always knew we could move things around to shape the story. But the big question that Mike kept asking, and I really appreciated it was, uh, have we shot real time scenes? Have we actually yeah. captured life? Cause we were so, or maybe I was when we first got there, I was like, let's get good B-roll. We have to show the country. But then Mike kept asking, what, what we, scenes yeah. have we shot? And so that was the big uh, challenge on set. And that was why we have, you know, I think despite us having limited time and not a lot actually happening while we were in country, you know, a lot happened yeah. from the civil war to the bombing. Um, you know, there's a lot of drama and conflict that takes place during that period of time. But while we were there ourselves, there wasn't. The, the moment with Debbie was significant because you were there, the little girl at the end, because you're there for a real moment where mm -hmm. the, you know, Hilanka is, is standing looking over this girl and you can feel the impact of, you know, 100 years of cultural and, and ethnic warfare. So, yeah. you know, as Mark said, we were always conscious while we were there being like, 
What's, what's the scene here? Okay, let's go to the coffee shop and see them planning out their route. Okay, let's see them on the road about to go do their stops at the different victims' houses giving supplies. Let's, so that was where our, we were very intentional. Uh, but, you know, a lot of this stuff was, was, again, trying to find little breadcrumbs along the way to yeah. help bring the story together. Yeah. I just want to do a quick little, uh, well, I ask while you're looking at the next question. Sure. Just do a little story here to let everyone know on Instagram. Hey. Where are Someone we? Is. You can see me. We're live on Instagram. No, you're on Instagram. This is live on YouTube. We got Mike. We're doing a live Q. There's &A so here. many can. I don't know what world <laughs> I'm in. This is. Check us out on YouTube. We're doing a live Q and A about no countries and Ireland. Do you think about how you will edit, or the look style while you're absolutely, absolutely on, on something like this in particular? I am. I am thinking as an editor. Absolutely. Quite a bit when I shoot. You know, something like His Name is Ray or a, a feature doc, there's a little less of that. There, it still needs to be there. But when you're shooting something in a short time, you need to be and thinking, how are we editing this together? What are our inserts? You, you know, how, like, you do need to be thinking as an editor because you can't fly back to Sri Lanka and get pickup shots. Yeah. You know, you got to get it all while you're in country. Again, that was one of Mark's reasons early on to bring me on was to have two cameras exactly. so that we could spread out and do that. So you got to be, I, I think, you know, having an editing background, documentaries, you know, you really sh should be fairly um, uh, knowledgeable in all aspects because mm -hmm. you, you really do need to know, know yeah. everything. It's going to come into play. And that's, uh, again, you got to think about who you're, you're, you're only as good at, they say like uh, you're, the, you're the sum of the or the average of the people you surround mm. you with you know I heard one thing recently someone said um, hang around with five millionaires and you'll be the six yeah. and so hang around with good filmmakers and you'll be the six mm. and I, I know Mike's skill set I know how he approaches filmmaking mm. so I know when, when I was approached for this film I could send Mike to shoot scenes and while he was doing that I was f literally driving around the country shooting drone shots and now, I don't suggest just focusing on drone shots for your documentary. This won't make a film. But part of the story in this film was this beautiful island that has tourism that was thriving and that had just come out of civil war. And then, bam, you have these terrorist attacks. And so this is where we both had to be shooting separate things. We, we knew we couldn't license all that footage. We had to capture it ourselves. And one other question was about release forms. Yes, we got release forms for everyone on that. That's why we had uh, Emily on this project, our producer. She was on it. She had big stack of printed release forms and she'd print them off at the hotel every morning. And so anyone we met, we would get a release form, we explain mm. what we're doing, explain the story. So those kids you saw in the film, they absolutely had the release form. We even got their parents because they can't sign it. They're minors, their parents signed it. Um, so yeah, get release forms. The broadcaster wouldn't let us put people in the film who weren't released. Couple more, a lot of more questions coming in. Um, how do you make characters feel confident in front of the camera? We we talk about this a lot. A lot. I, I think in both modules we, yeah. we touch on it. It's in both art of document. Yeah, it's both all in modules and yeah. art documentary. But you know, really for you know, I'll speak on myself and uh, you know, Mark can add in. But it's like these. It, there's there's a long process generally of building a relationship with somebody to the point where I mean just think about how someone will talk to a loved one versus how someone will talk to a, a news reporter. You're trying to get yeah. closer to that. You know how do you naturally get build a relationship with someone? You, yeah. you have food. You you share your heart. They share theirs. You know there's it, it's reciprocated and I think like that generally takes time mm -hmm. in, in a project like this. You know we. We were hanging out. All, we were hanging out all week with Amjad and the Hilanka crew, and I think that helped. Even in a short period of time, it was able to get um, real and truthful moments. And something practical to do is always, if you are on a tight timeline, explain the type of film you're making. Like, say, I, this isn't. You know, this isn't Desperate Hells. Is it called Desperate Hells Wives? Yeah, uh, is that a reality I, show? I've never like, seen it. But. Like, we we don't want a performance. You know, we don't want you performing here. We want, like, we, I want to see you, like, as you are when you're on your own. Like, we want to just see your truth. We want to hear your voice. Um, and, and so just trying to tell them that. Like, just tell them, be yourself. Like, don't, you know, try to pretend I'm not here and, uh, you know, act how you would act. And I might cue you when I need to, you know, ask a question or whatnot. Yeah. Um, what do you think about documentaries being too cinematic? Um, I don't know. I think if... It comes down, if you have a good story and the images are really compelling, then go for it. Go, go look at um, uh, um, 
what's it called? It's some it's, uh, some kind of heaven, I mm. believe it's called. Uh, very very cinematic. Uh, but you felt the stories, the pe- the characters are engaging. So I wouldn't get too concerned about being too cinematic. Again, we talk about this in the art of documentary. It's like you really need to be concerned about your story. And so if, if it... let, let me say this, like, because this is a question we get all the time. And it, it, there's a writer who said this. It was like uh, C.S. Lewis, I think. And he said, try to be original and you're going to look like a fool. Just tell the truth and nine times out of ten you're going to be original. Okay, and it's a, that to me is the same takeaway for filmmakers trying to be cinematic. Try to be cinematic and you're going to look ridiculous, in my mind. I can just see through it. Just tell the truth. Like, just, you know, make a pure story. Like, do the right thing. And I know that's a loaded question, but don't always try to do the, the crazy shots. Like, yeah. hold your shot yeah. on a person while they're spilling their heart out and just let me watch them. And that's cinematic. Yeah. You know, that takes that takes boldness, yep. that takes courage. Like not to always try to find interesting things. It's like be there. Yeah. Be present. Bring the audience there with you. And that's gonna really set you apart from people trying to do magic tricks, if that I mean, makes sense. I, I do a whole video of that in module two uh, of the art of documentary called The Art of Pause. And I show you about how to actually live in a moment and how to like a hmm. good song goes places it tells a story and a good edit is like music it has like valleys it has peaks it has changes and it it, it, it increases and decreases crescendo de- and decrescendo mm. and that's what you want in your film and so like mike's saying having moments of pause where, where you're where you're actually taking in what's happening is the most cinematic thing like we the beginning of killer be killed where joel comes out and punches that bob I, it, that wouldn't have been any better if we flew around with the gimbal. It was a slice of life, and that is, to me, that's cinema. That's yeah. cinematic. Um, just a couple more questions here, guys. Uh, we'll, we'll jump in here. Uh, do you guys bring others in post-production? Uh, again, you'll get to see Lewis and myself talk about how oh. we edited uh, No Countries and Island. Me, Mike, and Lewis all took turns, but Lewis was our main editor. He was the one who took all the scenes and built the timeline. And so, uh, yeah, we absolutely bring in people. We bring in... Um, uh, um, music composers. Mike's wor- Mike's worked with Hannon Townsend in the past, but Igor and Jeff, who worked on this, incredible, incredible. Oh, I look mm. back, and that's one of the things, my favorite parts of the film. Yeah, it was we, it was fantastic. Yeah. Um, Did we hire a sound guy? No. No. Um, you 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 made start recording. Can, can you speak more on the arc of the story? Was it difficult? To... Yeah. What's Real quick on that. I mean, we we had an idea on the arc. Just the the idea on No Countries and Island was that we wanted to take this idea that this was somebody's land, and to them this land was beautiful. And you know, we wanted to start by seeing it through the eyes of these kids. And it's this, you know, these sunsets. The streets have mystery, and there's companionship. And you know, two neighbors may not even know what they're. The, the other kid's ethnicity or religion is because it doesn't matter. So that's that was really the I, the seed we used to then build out the conflict, the tension, and then to finally come back. That that's the hope would be to come back to that yeah. pure place of kind of childhood vision on on your country. So that was kind of what we had. What went, what went in the middle <laughs> was uh, you know what we had to find yeah. while we were in country. If you're if you're part of module one for those of those for those of new to art of documentary, I actually post the treatment, the script. Oh yeah. Of it's very cool. The, and we didn't even the name was called Innocent Generation, and you'll see what me and Mike actually thought we were going to be capturing when we went to country. And you always want to have a plan. That's how you're an assertive filmmaker. And we show you the whole script. And, and, what's then, cool, throw, and then you'll throw it out. And, and then, then <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Then you throw it out. But It'll you're going be to similar. See, yeah. But you'll see what we were trying to do right. and then the film we came up with. So a lot of people ask that. How much of the film do you have in your mind? I'll, I'm like, go join the art of documentary. Yeah. You'll see exactly what we were trying to do beforehand. Let uh, me, real quick yeah. on this one. Yeah. Someone asking if you don't have a broadcaster, um, you know, do you just share your film? I actually talk about this in module two in releasing your film and something I did for the first couple of my docs that I did not have a broadcaster. They weren't that good. But what I did was I held the screening. I found an indie theater and uh, I did it that way. It's, a, it's an awesome video uh, to just kind of share my experience. And it was a very, 
empowering moment for me to see this film, mediocre film, I 30 minute doc that I did play on a 30 foot screen with probably less than 30 people in the audience. <laughs> it's, it's, but, but it was awesome. Which like, one was that? Uh, defined. I was there Yeah, that. I know, that I know. Awesome. I, I mentioned you in it being like, I think that was the first time Mark and I reconnected yeah, in a while. Yeah, it was, it yeah. was, yeah. No, it was great. So, anyway. Um, Boz, trusting people, again, don't treat them like characters in the film, treat them like humans in life. Um, if they feel that you're just trying to take their story, that's when they won't trust you. But if you're gonna tell their journey, that's when I, we find people have more trust. But honestly, if people won't let you tell their story, they're not a good character for your film. You know, you want people who want to believe in the vision and, and, and me and Mike are very upfront with people in our films about what we're trying to do. And if they don't wanna be a part of it, we're not gonna force them, we'll go find a new character. All these questions, I feel like I'm, re I'm redoing the course well, I know, here. the whole course here. Did you feel frustrated at some point? I think the second video on module two is called Filmmaking Process, which a lot of students are resonating with because it's about being frustrated, like coming back from a shoot day, like, did I capture anything meaningful? And like just, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a process of always kind of trying to think about what you're, what you're shooting, and is it gonna work in the edit? Getting frustrated with yourself, feeling yeah. like you didn't. Then you start playing around with it and be like, huh, this kind of will work, but I'm gonna need this. And it's just this constant you know, revision process. And that's why just a lot of these tools we, we, we teach our students with like sticky notes and journals, yeah. just trying to see yeah. the footage yeah. not always, sometimes it's nice seeing it on timeline, Sometimes it's nice just writing the general ideas of what you film that day to be like, okay, I filmed this. They talked about this. I'm gonna need to go from this beat. I need them. I need to see them now doing that. And and without being overwhelmed by you know hours and hours of footage, just kind of block it out so you can just kind of see the chapters. Yeah. And that's a way just to not feel so frustrated, but to feel a little more empowered. Be like, okay, I do have something, but I'm gonna need something else. Yeah. To get to somewhere else to get to the next place, if that makes sense. I'm about, uh, for the ASD film, the, the new feature doc I'm doing, I'm about to do the sticky notes because we've had, we shot over 30 days and we have so many little scenes. I'm right now like, ha, yeah. I know I need to just start looking at the film in a different di way. A different way. Because yeah. I could never look at, we right. probably right now have 80 hours of footage. I can't look at that in a timeline. Yeah. I need to look at it as sticky notes. Um, That's great. Do we capture Foley? No, we probably should. We don't. Uh, that's, yeah. we don't capture sound on set. If we had time. If we had time, but we, we, you know, in 10 days. Um, uh, Aaron Bagel's asking about, uh, uh, his no, name's Ray. Hopefully we're still soon. trying. Yeah, we're, we're, we've backtracked now. We're, we've got you, some good traction. We got, some, some maybe big screenings. But well, we we're, we're trying. I mean, we got, yeah, Tiff, Tiff Lightbox is very interested in Toronto to do it, but we're, we're now going to hold off. We're, we're, we're really trying to get that into some of the major festivals. So unfortunately we'll have to wait a little bit. I hope everyone can see it soon though. Uh, Layla, great question. Do we know what the audience would have a takeaway? Um, Layla is an amazing standout student, part of the art of documentary. Yeah. Big shout out to her. Um, you know, you can, what I, one of my favorite parts about filmmaking is I put out my film and then someone says, oh, did you, I loved how you did this with the film and you said this story. And I'm like, mm. oh, did I? Like every human is different. So what I actually find with, um, with the film is we have our theme, which the theme is what is the question we want to answer with our film, but then part of it's the magic. Like everyone, yeah. everyone interprets it differently. I, I honestly never go into a film trying to have, make sure the audience has a takeaway. I, I'm, I'm I, cause everyone's different. And if you try doing that, it, it, to me, it's just trying to please too many. It's like a chef trying, like they've got to do what's right for them. Yeah. And so for me, it's like, you're trying to make discoveries. You're trying to make discoveries from your character in the story about yourself. You're trying to put all this stuff together, but, but ultimately like, I'm not trying, you can't try to have a takeaway guys. No. I mean, unless you're making a very agenda focused documentary where you're trying to say something about climate change or something about this, it's like, okay, well then you're going to want them to take something away probably. Yeah. But for the types of films, Mark, usually character driven, you know, sort of observational discovery films, like you've got, you've got to just be true to yourself, allow the character to be true and just let them, let the character yeah. speak to the audience, how they're going to speak to them yeah. and, and yeah. don't try to force that too much. We just had a famous world renowned, Editor Lewis Gordon, pop in for a quick second. Oh yeah, yeah. Here's the editor. He's the, Here's editor. the whole team. I mean, this guy edited. Yeah, yeah. 
Here's, here's, here's Lewis. The, team. Just getting in. <laughs> the band is back. There you go. Um, Let me stay in for a sec, Lewis. Yeah, yeah, tell, yeah. tell us, let me ask Lewis a question. Yeah, Lewis, pull up a chair. There we go. Lewis is the editor on the film. Lewis uh, also talks uh, a little bit in Module 1 and quite a bit in Module 2. He shares um, his, his entire strategy for taking large sums of footage or small sums of footage and, and like conde- hundreds of hours of footage. Yeah, it's called the spine edit. Um, he talks about that module too. But a real quick question: I'd love yes. to hear your store. Your your kind of overall. We're talking about No Countries and Island, yep. by yep. the way. Yeah. And what I was, was I was what, on the the, uh, the live chat earlier? Nice. Okay. Nice. Nice. <laughs> I saw you in it. From an editing perspective, how do you not get overwhelmed? We come back from a country, and you know we give you a hard drive. We give you some notes. Like, how do you, how do you even approach that? Yeah, uh, well, I think it's all process driven, um, which I talk about in, in module two, but it's, it's overwhelming, first of all, when you get that and you have that task and it's, you have to watch hundreds of hours of footage and somehow turn it into a story. So it's what I rely on mentally is just a process that helps me go through that footage, but then also just develop structure and take it little bit by bit, stepping stone by stepping stone. I think when you run into, you run into struggles when you, you, you think about the big right. picture. So when that's when, that's when you get overwhelmed. When you're saying stepping stone by, are you, is that scenes? Like, are you, are, are you thinking, was, are you breaking was, interviews down? I mean, I, like, I, how do you take that then? Yeah, like what, what sticky notes? Really. I, I, I think it's dependent on the project one. Right. For this project specifically, it was, it was scene by scene. The because, different beats. Because there's so much verite and there's, there were so many scenes that we weren't sure. Would they would it. make it. Yeah. If they were make it or, or just like what was there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It was kind of like, like I remember the one scene which becomes a pivotal scene, uh, just watching it back today when they're on the car. Yeah. And they're driving, and yeah. the one person from Hialanka says that line about like, "Are you afraid of the future?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of those lines. Like, I remember it was Mark saying, "I remember that there was some some good stuff maybe said in this car ride." And then for a day, it was just going through this various car ride footage and figuring oh, out yeah, what was said. Yeah, that was and, and big. trying to place it and trying to figure out where that sticky note yeah. goes. Yeah. So it's. I remember shooting that, and and we had we're so and I I remember saying I was just like. I know they said something really good in there. <laughs> I don't remember where it was. I don't really remember what it was. But yeah. You gotta go find it. And there's like multiple. And Lewis there, would there find were multiple it. car rides too. Yeah, there's, there's there one were car a lot ride. Different car so rides. No, where it's like there's something yeah. said in one of these car rides. Yeah. So it was just taking that idea of a scene and going through that oh, instead I, of trying. That's to, the benefit of having a good editor. Figure out where yeah. it goes. Yeah. I, yeah. I'll, I'll say this: that when we did come back, there was less than you would hope on a film where we were like, we know. The overall arc but we don't know how we're gonna get there so for me personally the sticky notes we were just like scene by scene mm-hmm. me and Lewis uh, we just were like okay we would come into the office and we both kind of attack the edit simultaneously mm-hmm. I'm like I'm gonna cut this scene you cut this scene let's see we have them on the wall and we would watch them back and then once we'd watch them we'd go no that needs to go here yeah because at one point we had the Civil War coming way later, later in the way film, later. and then we're like, no, 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 no. this needs gotta to go come up, come yeah. up in the, it, earlier in the film. That was a big. That was a big. You'll make that's a, that's the beauty of filmmaking is you make these discoveries along the way, and it's just like you know, it's like your default position is writer's block. Like your default <laughs> position is just being in this state of like kind of, and then all of a sudden, once you're there, it's like, oh, that's there, and that's like drive through. Yeah. You know, then all of a sudden the freeway opens up. Yeah. But it's, it, you know, it, it's sitting in that place. And I think someone like Lewis, who, I don't know why I'm saying it like this, he has a degree in journalism. I talk to a lot of students about it. And I know, you know, going to university, whatever, pros and cons. I find that secondary education or at least reading lots of books, mm-hmm. he, he's got a very good head on his shoulders. He's a good thinker. He's able, wow. no, he's able to take ideas and not get overwhelmed by them. So if you haven't gone to school and you're in our ALD Academy, supplement that with just reading literature mm-hmm. because it, it, filmmaking is a lot of that kind of just taking a bulk amount of information and trying to figure out what the hell do I do with this? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's yeah. what, having somebody like a Lewis, but you could do that too. It, it's, it's going to allow you to finish these films. <laughs> yeah. That's the whole thing is I, I think that it's not difficult to start a documentary. It's difficult to finish it. And that's, uh, it's really what we try to explain with some of these sticky notes and these techniques on the YouTube channel and on the art of documentary. Uh, but Lewis has his own edit that 
we want to sit down and look at right now. I have a call for my next film at two yeah. o'clock. Mike yeah. has to go. Uh, we have we'll do right more now. Later. We have like three documentaries. Yeah, to go I gotta right go. Now. Yeah, you do have the jet. So we really thank you guys. Uh, Again, there's one week left for the Art of Documentary. Also, too, if you were, if you had the chance to watch um, No Countries and Island, we really encourage you. It's still on my channel. Uh, if you want to donate to Heal Lanka, there's a link in the description of that film. They're an incredible organization, a young group of uh, uh, Sri Lankan diverse. citizens, totally diverse, different backgrounds, and uh, they really understand the country. And so, yeah, if you want to help the victims of the terrorist attack, and also there's a lot of people in Sri Lanka right now who are in need of uh, medical care through COVID. There, that's what um, Hilanka is also working with. So thank you everyone uh, for watching this. Thank you for being part of the live stream. Thank you, Lewis, for being part of the team and popping in here. Uh, big shout out <laughs> yeah, to awesome. uh, Amaja Chalaka and the whole team over at uh, Hilanka and Yes TV for funding this. Uh, and again, if you want more information on documentary, Go check out theartofdocumentary.com. You'll get to interact with all of us there. And yeah, thank this you is so what, much. And this is what our Zoom calls are like. Yeah, exactly. A big part of our, 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 our community. There's the courses, the Facebook group, but then our Zoom calls. We, we get to do this. We yeah. get to have more of these conversations. Thank so you. if you like this. And help you with your films. Yes, yeah. exactly. So we'll see you in there, hopefully. Yeah, definitely. See you, everyone. Bye.